Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kenneth Farouja. I'm a governor on the board of Finance Malta Foundation. Finance Malta being the national promotional body for the financial services industry. And on behalf of the board on, and management, I wish to welcome you to this three-part part masterclass, which will be focusing on setting up funds in Europe. Undoubtedly, if one looks at the past decade, the asset management sector and the fund industry have gone through profound changes, um, impacted by a number of developments, um, to mention the recent one, uh, COVID, which is why we're having today um, this uh, webinar via one of digital channels, the onset of, of Brexit, um, various EU directives that have hit the asset management industry, uh, just to mention a few, the impact of, of the AFIM directive, the impact of, of MIFID. As well, we've seen um, the ramping up of technology, particularly um, you know, with the introduction of robo-advisory and, and non-traditional financial services operators that are entering the uh, asset management sector with their, with their propositions, as well as the everlasting debate of of passive and active strategy uh, strategies and what fits best for, 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 for our respective customers. With this in mind, and having discussed um, the organization of this event with the Malta Asset Servicing Association, Finance Malta felt that it was opportune to create this three-part masterclass, which has taken a, a funnel approach. So today's uh, first masterclass with the, will deal with uh, the European Fund and the Environment. Uh, we have two um, subject matter experts with us today who will be introduced shortly after my, my introduction, which will uh, discuss and dwell on a number of facets uh, impacting the, uh, the, 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 the funds industry. So uh, they will be discussing the choice of domicile, the choice of fund structures, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, using uh, an AFE structure or, or a notified AFE as for that, or going down the usage route or a professional investor fund or a private fund, and the ramifications of uh, the choice of fund structure, obviously depending on the target, uh, on the target investors. Uh, they will also speak about um, the, uh, the importance of appointing the right service providers to service the scheme. Uh, be it the fund administrator or prime board broker or, or custodian um, that will service the ongoing requirements of the scheme. And I think this today's session will serve as a good context for you know, tomorrow, tomorrow's second masterclass, which will deal with the actual setting up of, of, of a fund structure and the process around it. I think this is very, very important. Um, there is a lot of preparatory work that needs to be uh, catered for in setting up the fund structure, a significant number of agreements that need to be entered to, into uh, with the service providers to ensure that once the fund is on the launch pad, you know, you have all the necessary requirements that will allow the seamless operation of the way that the fund will be managed and the shareholders in the fund will be actually serviced on an ongoing basis. Last but not least, and the third masterclass will deal with a very important aspect of, of uh, launching a fund, which is clearly fundraising. And here again, um, we will have subject matter experts um, across the three uh, masterclasses. We have ensured that we have um, specialists that will be able to share their views and thoughts with you on the respective subject uh, matter that will be discussed during these three sessions. Um, I hope um, that you will find these masterclasses to be uh, insightful and, and, and informative and more than that relative to your own field of operation. As I say, and particularly when using um, digital channels, let's not allow this to be a radio program, a monologue, so please do uh, interject and do engage with our speakers to send um, um, your questions through, so you will ensure that it will be um, clearly relevant uh, to your interest in the space. Um, I wish you an enjoyable and enjoyable uh, masterclass sessions. Um, uh, as, I, as I said again, make sure it is engaging. And um, so, you know, it will make it as well pleasing for all our speakers will be participating in these three masterclasses. Last but not least, please allow me to thank uh, Finance Malta and to thank 
um, the speakers, um, both from the industry as well as I'm pleased to say that we have speakers from the regulatory authority for making time to contribute to uh, the information that will be relayed to this master class. Thank you uh, again and have an enjoyable uh, session this morning. For that uh, very informative presentation and the introduction to the masterclass today, I'd like to welcome all our attendees here today. Um, my name is Rebecca Schwere. I am Business Development and Corporate Services Manager at BOV Fund Services in Malta, and I'll be moderating um, today's session on the European uh, Fund environment. So to start off, I'd like to mention that there is a chat available for all the attendees. If at any point you have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat, which we'll be moderating from time to time, and we'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. So with me today, I have um, two guests who will be speaking on, on the panel today. And um, yeah, so we have Dr. Alexander Lindemann here, with us from uh, Lindemann Law, who's a partner over there in, in Switzerland. He's also hello, Rebecca. Well, hello, <laughs> audience. <laughs> I don't see the audience, but very warm welcome from, from Switzerland, from he's, Zurich. He's also the uh, president of the Capital Market Forum in Switzerland and a very active player in the fund management industry, being a member of the board of a number of, of funds. We also have Nicholas Mikalev with us here today, an advocate at Canada Advocates based in Malta uh, within the investment services and funds team of one of the leading local law firms. So Nick, uh, first of all, both of you welcome and thank you for joining us today on, on this first session of the, of the Masterclass. If I may start with you, Nick, I mean, we just heard a presentation from Kenneth where he spoke about the various challenges and changes that are facing the industry. And um, particularly, I mean, he mentioned Brexit, a number of regulatory updates to directives, etc. As an operator yourself, um, what is your perspective on this? How have these challenges impacted you? And what have you been seeing, particularly in the European fund environment of, of late? So good morning, everyone, and thank you, Rebecca, for, for your introduction. Um, when, when one mentions the word uh, challenges in, in light of the past year or so, I think there is one sort of elephant in the room that, that needs addressing. Um, the fact that we have dialed in for this conference as opposed to meeting in person and, and networking is already a sign of the times, I believe. Um, and we've probably all heard more than our fair share uh, about about COVID-19 uh, over the past year. So it's not, uh, it's far from our intention today to, to go into great detail as to um, COVID and the impact on our everyday lives, uh, as well as on the funds industry. However, I think uh, we would be uh, remiss to, to, to organize a, a masterclass on European funds uh, environment um, and developments without at least uh, touching upon the impact of the pandemic at a high level uh, and how the European funds industry has reacted to such challenges. Um, I think first and foremost, from, from a real operational perspective, um, one must point out that the, the industry had extensive liquidity challenges, um, you know, particularly uh, funds trading in uh, fixed income securities uh, and less liquid assets, you know, re real estate, private equity and the like. Um, these these challenges arose from either depreciation and asset value, I mean surges in volatility due to uncertainty, and substantial redemptions from customers who were not sure what the world uh, post COVID nineteen would look like. Um, also, when seen in the context of the existing legal and and regulatory uh, framework, you know that the European funds industry is highly regulated as an industry. Um, at an international, regional, and, and local level. Um, market participants in this space are, are subject to rigorous operational governance, uh, compliance, risk management, and AML requirements. Um, I mean, in, in, in 2020 and, and so far in early 2021 alone, you know, funds and fund managers have, uh, have been asked to comply with the Sustainable Financial um, uh, Finance Disclosure Regulation, guidelines issued by ESMA on liquidity stress testing, uh, performance fees, and the fifth anti-money laundering directive, uh, to name but, but a few. Um, and this is also uh, 
you know has been has been further increased in terms of of complexity with the member state competent authorities having an enhanced focus on on uh, on compliance risk management and the topic that uh, I, I call it the topic that seemingly never stands still which is which is aml um so the general perception of the funds industry as 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 a whole from the outside um is is such that there is perhaps a lack of faith in the industry or that it is trending in a negative direction but if one had to look at um you know had to look at the numbers it, it is actually quite the opposite um the the numbers show that the trend is actually very positive and the the um, the net assets of european uh, funds at the end of 2020 rose to 18.8 uh, .8 trillion which to put in perspective is an increase of, of over six percent so there's a very positive performance from from the eu funds industry in what was a a very challenging and a very tough year for for market participants um while of course there was a bit of a downturn in the first quarter of, of 2020 the industry recovered and some countries had extremely encouraging results um you know there was Ireland that was up nine percent, Luxembourg up six point five, and and Sweden almost fourteen percent. So there was there was there was a lot of, there were a lot of positives um, throughout the year twenty twenty in the European funds industry, and the message here is you know with all the challenges that there were regulatory, operational, or otherwise, the European funds industry actually throughout twenty twenty um, showed that it is an industry that is uh, alive and well, and has shown that it has uh, great resilience and and a positive future, I believe. You know, even despite the perception, things are moving well and in in the right direction. And Alexander, if I may move to to you now, being an operator based in in Switzerland and actually being active on on a number of funds yourself, what is your perception of the challenges that have been facing the industry? Thank you very much. For, first of all, Rebecca, a um, very warm, a very warm welcome. Also, to I see that we have four, 44 attendees, which is marvelous. Um, um, a wonderful good morning here from Switzerland. Thank you very much uh, to Rebecca for organizing this wonderful um, and exciting panel. And also for, um, thank you very much uh, for, for the MFSA. Um, it has not to, to be underestimated the very important role that the regulator plays when it comes to a fund jurisdiction. So I'm extremely happy and excited that um, MFSA will also take part. Uh, here uh, in in person in in this in this panel, I mean, what we actually see is that we have always challenges <laughs> in the in the fund industry. We have it's interesting that actually the regulate the role of the regulator has has um, has a little bit decreased of the national regulators. I mean, it's it's interesting that actually the driving force um, comes from 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 Brussels, right? I mean, when um, and and even from from the G20 and um, so we, we, we see that there are, so to speak, cows that are driven through the, the, through the countries and, and through, the, to, um, um, through, the, yeah, through the countries. And, and in this, we had the country, we had the cow of the, um, of the automatic exchange of information that was driven uh, through, through, the, through the world, through the entire world. And actually it turned out now it's business as usual, right? And and people no longer think about it. In in, in the beginning, it was big outcry, and so <laughs> people were really, um, yeah, it was really difficult um, how to 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 how to respond to such a challenge, such a fundamental challenge, exchange of of tax information um, throughout the world. Now we have um, basically found the modus vivendi with this. Um, and it's it's more or less business as usual. You do a, a few clicks in the end, and and do you and your reporting, and 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 the same I think is is now happening with with anti money laundry uh, challenges um, we had um, across the world. We we become more and more digital. It becomes more and more easy to detect um, money laundry, and 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 now we. Yeah, we, we we do our homework here on this this front across the globe, basically, and um, so we 
here also we will come with uh, with the models with Wendy, I think Rebecca and, and, and Nick. I think we will we will i mean this this will soon become i mean we have um let, let's be a little bit more specific here um we have basically in our fund we have i mean we have a maltese um local um compliance officer and aml officer um that um i already told in the morning nick was educated by ganado which uh, we were very helpful he um ganado here was there wide expertise um, helped us to, to, to bring our compliance and AML officer up to speed. Um, we then have regularly updates from, from, from you, Rebecca, from, from BOE. You, I mean, you basically help us um, with, with scanning the landscape of what is important for us as a fund operator. Um, and, and, and provide us with selective um, um, newsletters and, and selective um, decrees and, 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 and practice notices from the MFSA, which is, which is extremely helpful. And um, so this, this basically means that we feel very good um, prepared. And I think we are handling, we are handling these, these challenges, these challenges well. And, and and also to maybe mention drop a few few um like more pragmatic um challenges i mean we had to face a new beneficial ownership registry right that's also an international trend so there we had to to find a way how to to tackle this and um, we have uh, the so-called rec REQ re, uh, reporting that is has to be filed annually for each fund, and this uh, this is is interesting for the last uh, three years since this has been introduced. Um, it changes, it changes, it keeps changing annually. Um, so um, in, in 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 like in in correspondence with international uh, changes. So basically, here the Maltese regulator. Is, is keeping up with international uh, uh, challenge and, and international drive for more scrutiny. And also an interesting challenge, and, and there maybe later we can also um, div, uh, um, uh, talk about uh, Nick, is the dark six. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting that, um, the, yeah, how is, is, is the fund actually, is, is it a, a tax avoidance um, tool under the, under the dark six? Um, I definitely think not. It's not the case. It's 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 not. Um, but that these these were all. I mean, these were all um, regulatory, um, basically regulatory um, comets. If you if you want to speak with the stars, these were re regulatory comets that came out of the out of the universe <laughs> into the Malta um, into the Malta cosmos, and basically we as a fund regulator together with you from BOE, the guest together with 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 uh, expert lawyers on the ground, and and together with the MFSA, we had to tackle. <laughs> Mentioned quite a lot of things from REQs, the way I met to update um, the importance of a solid financial regulator in choosing a jurisdiction. And Nick, even you focused quite a lot on the increasing regulatory pressures throughout the funds industry in general and, and across jurisdictions, updates, directives, and so on. And I mean, this can sound a bit daunting almost, um, especially if you, you're starting up. I mean, if we consider this masterclass, it's about how to set up a fund in, in Europe. So um, where do you actually start from? I mean, considering all these challenges and these points that you were mentioning and, and constant updates, as you, you have both explained, I imagine it could at times pose quite a barrier, perhaps, to, to those trying to, to set up, to, to prospective um, managers, promoters looking, looking to set up a fund. So again, looking at uh, seeing as we're looking at uh, how to go about it, how to set up a fund in Europe, Nick, uh, what, what would your suggestions be? What are your suggestions to these prospective managers and operators looking to enter the industry? Yes, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with, with you and, and, and Alexander in the sense that the, uh, the European funds industry has, is, as we've said, highly regulated, right? So um, as a startup or as a small to medium-sized market participant, uh, any uh, lighter touch uh, regu uh, regulatory regime or vehicle can add a significant advantage to 
um, uh, to, to, to such entities. Um, as a jurisdiction, Malta has traditionally always been geared towards um, such small to medium sized and startup entities um, for, for as long as I can remember. Um, the, the regulator has always tried to be innovative in creating um, vehicles and regimes that help particularly startup funds, startup asset managers. Um, and and uh, I mean, the, the, the unique and the first one that comes to mind because it's been around for, um, for, for quite a while is the Professional Investor Fund, which uh, is perhaps the most known of the, uh, the Malta unique uh, vehicles um, across the European funds industry. And it's uh, while it's um, sort of beyond the scope of today's session to go into the nitty gritty of each of these types of regimes, because I understand this will be uh, discussed in detail tomorrow. Um, just to give people a bit of a flavor, the, the Professional Investor Fund, which is also known as the PIF, is, um, is a structure which uh, is lighter as, uh, in terms of its regulation. Uh, it offers benefits like um, reduced or limited investment restrictions. Uh, you don't have the requirement to appoint a depository um, and, and is managed by a de minimis AFIM. So there are significant advantages there in terms of um, being able to operate in a fund environment within a fund framework, but perhaps not under the extensive scrutiny of AIFMD, for example, or, or USITS. Um, now, this vehicle, it's important to, to, to mention, cannot be passported throughout the EU in the similar way that, that, that the Alternative Investment Fund can, um, but it is still available under national private placement regimes and, and reverse solicitation and so on and so forth. So um, it's particularly attractive for individuals who, who know who is going to um, invest in the fund, have a network of investors, and, and there won't be any active marketing there taking place. Um, perhaps another more recent innovation from the MFSA uh, in this space has also been the Notified Alternative Investment Fund. Kenneth mentioned um, this vehicle in, in the introduction and it has seen significant um, success in Malta as, as a vehicle. I would say over the past two years, it is by and large the most common um, new uh, fund vehicle that, 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 is being, that is being sought after. Uh, the, the Notified Alternative Investment Fund, also referred to as, as a Notified AFE, is, um, is one which can be passported freely throughout the EU uh, in the same manner as, as a normal uh, AIF can. Um, however, the entity is not a licensed entity. Uh, it, is, it is included on a list of Notified AFEs. Um, what this does is it accelerates the, the process to, to start up the fund. Um, so it's very expedient in terms of time to market. The, uh, the MFSA have 10 working days within which they um, are to include such a fund on the list of notified AFES once they have received the, the complete pack of, of documentation required by the rules. Um, so there one immediately says, you know, I mean, 10 working days is, 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 is a, a very quick turnaround for, for, for a regulator to actually launch a fund. Um, and, and additionally, you have, uh, we mentioned the, 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 the problems or, or the, um, the, the, the burdens and regulations that there are at this moment in time. With a notified AFE structure, one removes the double, um, double regulation. So with a normal alternative investment fund, um, one has uh, regulation under AIFMD for both the fund and the manager. With the notified AFE regime, given it is, uh, it is not a licensed entity, uh, it is the alternative investment fund manager, the AFIM, that takes the responsibility for compliance of the notified AFE. Uh, and the, the Malta Financial Services Authority regulates the AFIM, um, but not the notified AFE directly. So there is an indirect supervision. So there one eliminates the, uh, the dual layer of, of regulation. Um, so it, Malta tends to cater for the increased challenges by having these... Um, these unique structures that that perhaps can assist the the startup um, or, or the smaller to medium sized entities that want to sort of create a track record to to start to hit the ground running um, without the additional costs that obviously additional regulation bring about with them, and then be in a position three four years down the line to say okay we you know we're happy with the jurisdiction and we we're, we're, we've got our our. Um, our feet under us, we're, we're, we're good to go, we're operational, we're really enjoying it. 
and then you can progress to a full threshold alternative investment fund, for example, from uh, from a PIF and so on and so forth. So the way that Malta as a jurisdiction has gone about this is to uh, is to tackle it from the regulatory perspective. Of course, naturally, um, Malta has additional benefits, which I'll, I'll allow Alexander to, to expand upon. But the fact that we are English speaking, uh, the education system in Malta is also um, quite sophisticated. Um, you know, we have a, an approachable regulator. So there are the soft benefits as well. Um, I find that, that people enjoy attending board meetings in Malta when it's done in person. Um, but I mean, th these, these are the soft benefits that perhaps uh, are, are better explained by an operator than, than, than myself, but they do exist too. So in addition to the regulatory, there's also the soft benefits. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for that insight. It's great to hear that, you know, there are uh, one of the solutions to the regulatory challenges that, that we are facing and are, are increasing. Um, and I think another thing to mention here is, is that, you know, speaking about setting up a fund for the first time, I think in Malta we're also quite used to doing quite a bit of hand-holding, um, particularly in the beginning when it's the first time operators as well. So, Alexander, I'll put this to you. I mean, being an operator yourself and being involved on quite a number of funds, I mean, in, in various jurisdictions, you, you're experiencing not just Malta, but other jurisdictions as well. So how how would you comment on what Nick has said and what do you think are the factors that one needs to look at and the considerations to make when you're looking at starting starting up a fund? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And two two things I would like to allude. Um, of, of course, uh, um, yes, it was it was fantastic, the, the hand holding that we <laughs> that we received by BOV, not only by Rebecca, but also um, by your former boss, uh, Joseph Camilleri and his name sibling <laughs> who is also Joseph Camilleri at PricewaterhouseCooper. So I think these these really um, uh, these P persons really need a big thanks um, for us um, in in Malta uh, um, uh, being able to succeed and and also another very important point for me from me as a <clears throat> uh, that I would like to mention as an operator um, what Nick said, yes, exactly. When when you start a fund, um, it can be very nice to have a uh, to have, for example, a PIF in Malta because you can you can start also with um, with, with with banks um, in in another country that you are used to. For example, if in in our example, we had already. Um, very um, um, strong relationships um, um, for the strategy that we are doing um, with the fund in in Switzerland, and we were able to actually keep the the Swiss banks for for the PIF, and it helped us to to do the transition, and and so we we set up um, this this wonderful um, professional investor fund, short PIF, in in Malta, and. We are now at at the close um, to the 100 million threshold. That is um, um, a threshold for for um, open-ended funds to 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 be allowed um, uh, as as a below threshold so-called alternative investment fund. Which means that yes, you can you can you have a few alleviations, including that you don't need a on the ground Malta custodian bank. So we are now at this this crossroad that that Nick. Uh, uh, nicely described and we are now monitoring the threshold and, and we might soon come to a point where we have to actually utilize um, one of and we are talking already to to the Malta uh, banking industry that will be um, part of, of this master class in, in part through and part three and we are talking already to rail we are talking to Sparka so we are talking um, to, um, to 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 um, um, to Swiss quote so um, this is um, yeah. Th this is this is actually, of course, for us nice that we have um, names, well-known names and, and brands in, in in the custodian fund custodian industry. But um, um, and and I think when when it comes to selecting uh, a suitable fund uh, a structure and, and a suitable uh, fund uh, jurisdiction, and and there um, I would like to allude to the, the like the, the general overarching topic of of, of this master classes, like the European fund, uh, European fund environment, and it basically means 
um, when you starting such a project, um, um, whether you are like a like a high, ultra high net worth uh, individual um, that has to set up a, a family office or set up like a, a wealth a private wealth structure, or whether you are an, an asset manager, actually like a real estate, like a, a private equity venture capital asset manager, you you asking yourself a number of you have to ask yourself a number of questions in order to decide which jurisdiction in europe or even globally is is the right jurisdiction for your venture and 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 that is actually because um my role is here is twofold right rebecca this is very i think is is one of the, the the reasons why you invited me we can give operational aspects but we can also as a law firm um give some insights on, on how to select and, and, and compare different fund jurisdiction. And um, it's, it's not a secret, our law firm, we, we have five fund jurisdiction that we have in, that we are specialized on. Um, it's, it's like the, the, the very big um, fund jurisdictions like Cayman Island and Luxembourg. And it, it's, it's the more, um, and the more pearl, pearl and, and, boutique and, and, and specialized fund jurisdictions like Malta, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, I don't dare to mention because <laughs> it's it's really, um, um, yeah, it, it's very, really very special here at the fund environment in, in Switzerland. So most most of the time we, yes, we, we actually, um, our clients um, tend to set up funds in, in, in one of these non-Swiss jurisdictions. And um, there, Malta is, is 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 a fantastic is is really a, a, a fantastic place because it, you can combine as 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 um, Nick told you can combine the, the the work and the pleasure. Um, you can when you have when you have the board meetings, um, you can travel to a destination that is actually a holiday destination and that has sea, and it is very nice people, very good um, food, very good hospitality. So that for us as Swiss is is, is nice com and, and complimentary because we don't have any sea, right? <laughs> and we don't have any sea fish. So it's it's really a nice combination, I think, especially for for um, for continental. Um, um, for, for continental high net worth individuals and, 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 and for uh, continental um, asset managers. Let me, let me briefly maybe try to, to, to um, talk about what are the decisive factors when, when, when people from the audience, and, and I want to once more invite you, please ask questions. Ah, and we actually, I see there are some questions and, and I think Rebecca, you are asking them later. So once more, I invite you, please, I mean, be interactive and, and feel free to, to ask questions and, and take the chances. What are the decisive um, factors um, for, um, for to, to set up a, a fund structure and decide which is actually the best uh, structure? And there, Nick, you can, uh, I mean, you will share your view as well. I think, a very important thing is is the asset class in the first place. I mean, you need to de to 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 define the asset class, and um, the question then also is whether it's 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 like a daily type of um, monitoring and decision making, or with the alternative investment funds, you have certain um, points in time and, and and certain rhythm when you when you make decisions, and that allows you then also, I mean, to to utilize. Uh, uh, better and easier to utilize a fund jurisdiction that is not so close uh, or there's like medium range like Malta and Switzerland. And so that's, it's the asset class. I think that is that is one driving factor. One other very important um, factor is, is the distribution. I mean, are you, how are you going to raise your capital? Um, we see Malta very much as also a uh, very good jurisdiction when it comes to uh, private wells. I mean, um, when when entrepreneurs are setting up their family offices or their private well structures, it's it's multi is a very very good choice. Um, but also for the alternative investment fund industry is marvelous because I mean, with with the Malta um with with the malta um being a member of the European Union and a very acknowledged uh, member, um it has the full passport um, on the one hand for 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 the a product passport right for the IEFs right um, and and but also um, it 
one can set up um, like structures that allow the activity passport, like the distribution then of. So that's that's a very important point. Is I mean how yeah how you raise your capital, um, and um, then of course you have you have, have tax um, tax aspects that um, that are relevant, and and here you can. Of course, I mean, most important is I think is is where is 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 the pragmatic uh, is the pragmatic um, that that Nick mentioned the pragmatic aspects um, they are not underestimated, and and then the tax of course is also very interesting in Malta with um, with the possibility to 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 have very low tax tax rates. Um, so there, there's an international competition um, between when you when you have in the management company, I mean, you, you, you will. Uh, um, all our clients look into like the different tax um, levels and niveaus, and there also Malta is, is, is of course uh, quite, quite attractive with, with um, this distribution and, and credit back mechanism. Um, yeah, that's 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 my my take, just in, in a nutshell, on on the size of factor for for comparing different jurisdictions and yes maybe maybe nick you can also um yeah, share yeah. some some shed some light what what's your what is your philosophy here <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and and actually that, that's great and alexander you mentioned one particular word that i'd like to point out which is you mentioned a niche and i i think that's exactly it right because you, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's not that we're here today saying that more does everything for everyone. It's absolutely not. It's more of a niche of um, of operators, more the smaller to medium-sized ones. And it depends what strategies as well they have in mind. I mean, before we we continue with the discussion, I'd like to take a look at um, a couple of questions that have come in. Oh, super. The it's a super. Yeah. Um, the first one from Jeremy is asking the, the panelists here, yeah, Nick and Alexander, where do you think the asset management industry is heading in his view? Specifically, they've seen a surge of retail investors opting to invest on their own account or various platforms rather than paying management fees. So is it maybe a shift to more passively managed funds, do you think, in your opinion? Nick, what, what would you say about this? I think I, I can definitely handle or, or I'm better placed to handle the second part of the question oh. relating to the crypto funds. And I'll, I'll allow perhaps um, uh, Alexander as the chairman of, of, the, of, of the board of our funds to comment on the more operational perspective and, and um, the strategy perspective. So from, from a crypto funds perspective, yes, the MFSA does allow. However, there are... Um, there are additional requirements. So there is a, a notified AFE may not invest in crypto funds. A, a, um, a professional investor fund is, is permitted to invest in, in crypto funds, but there is a specific additional set of rules which would be applicable uh, to, 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 to such crypto funds. Um, and this is when one is investing directly into cryptocurrency. So of course, um, a professional investor fund, a notified AFE or an AIF can invest in companies um, which trade in cryptocurrencies. That is fine. That is a normal private equity type of, of, of structure. But to invest directly in cryptocurrencies, um, in, in that particular instance, then uh, one must establish a professional uh, investor fund and have to adhere to this additional uh, set of rules which are applicable to cryptocurrencies. So one would have the, the normal PIF rules, and in addition, they would have the um, the 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 subsequent license conditions, which are applicable to PIFs investing in virtual currencies, um, in so far as the the uh, from from my perspective, in terms of the the, the where the asset management uh, industry is heading, I think uh, Kenneth even uh, alluded to, to this slightly slightly earlier when he mentioned. Um, robo investment advisors and so on and so forth. I think there is going to be a shift towards more passively managed funds. And um, the art of actively managed funds will not be lost because there is always something to gain from uh, human decision making process when it comes to to asset management. At least this is my 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 opinion. Um, and while retail investors um, are investing on their own account, I mean, particularly over the past year or two, when it comes to selecting cryptocurrencies in which to invest um, on a monthly basis, 
I think that the the extent uh, asset management is not something that one picks up from reading a couple of articles on the internet. I think it is it is an art which uh, and a skill which is developed over time, over experience, and and is 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 quite is quite particular. So. Um, the retail investors managing on their own account will never replace the asset management and funds industry, particularly when we're speaking about the institutional level. So from the, the European funds industry perspective, uh, the vast majority of the assets under management are institutional um, investors. So uh, insurance companies, pension funds, and so on and so forth. So uh, there may be some retail investors that opt to go uh, go rogue and go alone for, for 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 a period of time but i do not believe in my opinion um that that this will replace uh, that this will replace the um, the the uh, active management from asset managers um I, i'm not sure alexander if, if if you have a particular opinion on this point uh, no thank you very much um for this question um it's from from jeremy um jeremy I, I mean, we advise asset managers and, and fund managers um, over 10 years. And, and the trend that we see is, yes, it's correct. On the one hand, it's a passive. It's a passive um, asset management. It is like uh, index funds and index products that are very popular um, to save uh, costs on the one hand. Um, we don't see so much that people actually, we also see, yes, partly that people really take their time and, and invest on their own. But um, that is, I think, only a very small portion of, 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 of people that can actually afford to, to, to spend so much time on, on, on doing it on their own. So we see a great future for, for the fund industry um, 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 going forward. On the one side, yes, of course, passive um, investment, but also very important, and um, not only for Malta, but very important, especially for, for investors, is, is alternative investment funds. Because, I mean, it's more and more clear that um, if you want to have some some good performance and, and want some risk betting that alternative asset classes are becoming more and more important and 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 more and more asset managers actually also here in, in Malta and in, in Switzerland make um, new make up new businesses set up the, the, the just to name a few of them is like like is is is, is private equity private equity industry the venture capital uh, in industry as it manages the real estate um the crypto you meant you name it i mean these are all very important the mega tra even the arts right and and these are all very very important alternative asset classes that need a suitable um need a suitable format and and for this format um we really see um, Malta is one of the one of the the fr frames and and the jurisdiction that is that is suitable for especially for for asset managers that already are successful um, um, and and now set up their their uh, a new new fund. And on on this point, uh, Alexander, in fact, the uh, Malta as a jurisdiction is catered for the alternative asset class. So um, not only historically, but even if one had to take the numbers today, um, USITS funds in Malta actu are actually only 19% of the net asset value. So th that gives you a bit of an idea that the rest is is PIFs and, and AIFs, um, mm -hmm. including notified AIF. So as a jurisdiction, both in terms of the expertise of the service providers, um, but also in terms of the way we are set up um, institutionally to, 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 to assist clients. We are, we are far more comfortable as a jurisdiction, I believe, with, um, uh, with, with, with offering uh, the professional investor fund solution and the alternative investment fund solution. For use, it's typically um, service providers or, or the, 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 um, the promoters behind the, the, the fund would prefer to have, uh, let's call it a global brand of a depository. And this is why Luxembourg is such a large jurisdiction when it comes to USITs. So Malta has it has its fair share of USITs, but it's not tended to be a focus of the jurisdiction. It is more the alternative asset class. So um, it dovetails very nicely with what you're saying here in terms of the importance of, of the alternative um, investment asset class going forward with, with what Malta offers as a, as a jurisdiction.
Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I see also a lot of questions about crypto cryptocurrency, right? Yes, so it's it quite an, an interesting topic, and I'll be happy to then pick up um, any individual questions on a one-to-one -one basis if there's any anything more specific, and I direct it to the to the speakers accordingly. Because I'd like to move on to one particular point. So okay. far, we've been speaking about you know setting up your own structure. And I think we've just been thinking about having your own fund um, and owning the complete structure. Alexander and and Nick as well. I mean. I'd like to ask you because there's also an option of renting a, a sub fund under an existing an existing platform. So, at which point and how how do you choose be between the two? Yeah, I can just uh, give an example or tell a story how how this happened. Um, when our clients uh, asked us to to set up a Malta fund, um, we actually yes we we obtained um, we talked to different providers in in Malta and we basically had the choice. Um, Make or buy. So, <laughs> this uh, this 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 was a this this was a, a big question, and and we talked to a number of of platforms, um, which um, is of course a very helpful a very very helpful industry when you have when you rent an alternative investment fund manager who already is licensed, who already has a, a strong uh, track record with the regulator, and um, who already has as a very organized um, um, system that you can just plug in as a as, as a um, asset manager or as a, as a private individual you can just use it uh, as, as a yeah as, as a rental solution so to speak and as someone that can bring you up to speed and help you understand how it works and and then once you have picked this up maybe and and, and the funds and assets are growing you you might be able to um to yeah to even take your your sub fund away from from the from the platform and then set up set it up as a, as as your own um fund or manager um that is that is one um um possibility that is is very interesting and there we had really quite um quite good players uh, that we found and, and quite good offers that we, we saw in malta um on the other hand yes i mean being already a fund specialist um and then having talked to uh, to then uh, joseph camilleri from bov basically <laughs> he um he basically yeah talked us also a little bit in or like made us um, um, say familiar with the option in, in, in like the nice parts of, of setting up an own um, self-managed fund, um, which is which is of course also a nice um, a thing. And um, of course, yes, it, it gives you also, yeah, I mean, gives you of course, I mean, if you already, are familiar with with how it works in the fund organization. Um, it gives you um, uh, a little bit more, yeah, con control and 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 um, being. I mean, you set up your own house rather than rent the house or, or buy a, a flat in 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 a house that already exists. So I think it really depends on on the circumstances and on a level of of familiarity with 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 a fund i mean a fund is not is not a kindergarten a fund is is a very serious exercise and um we see that many many clients of us are happy um yes to yeah to take the the experience or to profit from experience from from existing players but we also um work with with with, with many asset managers and base managers yes they 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 are bold enough to to set up their, their own, and have the experience and the track record to set up their own structure so that's that's just from a yeah from from a the, just a big picture and of course yes there are a lot of small details then also that play into this would you like to add to that? Yes, from from a regular. I mean, uh, what what Alexander very uh, eloquently explained was the operational side. From a regulatory perspective, um, which is the 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 role which which which, which I'm here to play on on the panel is the fact that um, obviously when one is making the decision as to whether to uh, plug into an already existing system or create your own. Um, 
the 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 main element of uh, w w the main elements the two key elements that 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 um are in play here are the the time to market as well as your independence um from a time to market perspective it seems to be a, a, a straightforward decision as to plugging into an already existing system whereas independence one would set up their mm. own but going back on the innovative uh, solutions that the MFSA have have come up with um, is a, a lesser known um, product which is referred to as the the um, uh, the recognized incorporated cell company the RIC which um, allows a, a, an asset manager to create a platform wherein each fund is its own legal person so you would have the recognized incorporated cell company uh, at the top of the structure, underneath each, uh, underneath the, the recognized incorporated cell company, one would have a number of um, cells, each of which would be a CCAV in its own right. So this allows um, an operator such as Alexander to say, listen, I would like to plug into an already existing system, um, but I want my independence. I don't want my financial statements to be consolidated with other sub funds, for example. I, I want to have my own structure. Um, and by plugging in as a cell under the recognized incorporated cell company, one is plugging into a is plugging into an already existing system with a network of service providers, which is which is uh, already in place with a registered office, with a board of directors, and so on and so forth, which can be um, assisted for by, by, by the RIC while also having your separate legal personality. In, in Malta, as we know, um, every sub fund has segregated assets and liabilities, and this is uh, established in, in law. But some foreign service providers don't feel comfortable that um, this is enough, that, that this is sufficient for them to, to be able to operate. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, while it is firmly established in, in, in law, they would prefer to have their own legal entity um, the the RIC would allow you to have a plug and play situation where if after three years um, an operator like like Alexander decides thank you for the head start we really appreciated our time together we would now like to plug out and operate as a standalone the RIC actually allows you to uh, grab a cell and literally pull it out of the structure and operate as a standalone so um, it's, it's not a, a vehicle which has picked up immensely. It has um, its purposes and it has been used. Um, but I think there's a lot to explore with, with the RIC structure to cater for this particular problem that Alexander has mentioned, which is, of course, that of um, trying to juggle the interests of renting versus versus setting up your own. Um, I, I thought to mention it because it's it's perhaps a lesser known solution in, in Malta. And, and thank you, thank you so much for that, um, Nick, as well. So one more question that, that's come in here from Martin. Um, currently, EU regulations are putting pressure on, for example, Malta as well to unify regulations. In your experience, I think this question is directed to, to you, Alexander, um, having your experience in a, multiple jurisdictions. What are the mm -hmm. factors, again, that clients consider when choosing a jurisdiction? So what particularly might attract them to, to Malta? What are the, the niche industries here? What are the key factors that would make Malta attractive, particularly for um, certain segments and operators? Yeah, it's 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 this is uh, this is correct that I mean I mentioned we all, we we all mentioned it in the beginning we have here in this panel we have the MFSA and 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 in the end who I mean it's an application in the end it's it's really an application you make you make an application with the regulator <laughs> and you deal with the regulator on a daily basis so that basically means the regulator is is a very important um, role. It has a very important role and and, and a very important uh, responsibility. And on the one hand, yes, the regulator has to be has to be the the the, um, the person that is is so to speak the um, is is the yeah is, is invites the guest to the island. And on the one hand, yes, has to um to keep and 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 um keep the reputation that's that's the same with, with all regulators and and here 
we see, yes, um, the Malta regulator has a very good approach that he invites from various jurisdictions people to work in, in the MFSA. So there is, I think there's international um, and, and, and we mentioned that, yes, Malta um, having a English uh, Commonwealth tradition uh, has, um, is, is very attractive uh, due to this uh, Commonwealth uh, um, culture and, and, and Engl I mean, f English fluency and, and English British culture. And that is, I think it's, it's very much the culture and, and the regulator, I think, and, and then of course, yes, I mean, we see um, a specialty in, in gaming and cryptocurrency. Um, also, I think just um, from a pragmatic point of view, um, I'm not sure how, how the custodians in Malta on the ground, how strong they are when it comes to cryptocurrency and maybe they're also a little bit biased being a Swiss, uh, a Swiss uh, a fund lawyer. Um, we see here in, in, in Switzerland, um, very, very experienced and licensed uh, crypto banks. Um, not, not a whole uh, large number, but we see, um, we see uh, three or four uh, players that can be combined with a Malta fund. So I think that's, that is, that is, that is something important when you, when you have a crypto uh, project, I think it, it falls, it, it, it rises and falls uh, with, with also with, with the custodian. Uh, in in many cases and and there i think it's um it can be an interesting option to to utilize experienced uh, um swiss crypto banks in a combination with 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 a malta um especially pif right and um, that is um something that um that that has to be examined and if i may add to that i mean i think one of the we find is that um, we're often labeled as a very pro-business jurisdiction as well. I mean, you mentioned, Alexander, the importance of having a solid financial uh, services regulator as we do the MFSA. And I mean, as as the company BOB Fund Services, which, which I represent, when we assist our clients in setting up their funds and they have a particular strategy or a particular issue that they wish um, to get further guidance on, it's even possible that we set up a one-to-one -one meeting with the regulator to get the best guidance on which is the best um, way forward and, and how to how to go about it. So it's it's a robust um, uh, field of regulation that there, that there is out there. But that is, so that is fantastic. Uh, not all regulators, that's absolutely just to, to, to exactly. confirm that. It is, with all our fund projects, we had initial meeting with the MFSA um, um, and discussing the pros and the cons and, and, and the milestones and, and the most important um, things. And just, just to confirm, this, this is, yes, this is fantastic. And that is really something that speaks for, for Malta, I guess. Hey, Nick, is there anything you would like to, to add at this point as well? Uh, no, just two, two, two minor points really on this point of the, the meeting face-to-face. -face. It's, it's actually um, black on white as part of our application process that the first step is if you want at the option of the promoter is a face-to-face -face meeting with the regulator so that you explain the project, uh, you mm -hmm. present them with a set of slides as to what you have in mind and they can understand the project better before they actually receive the pack of documentation which um, it may seem like an, an extra step and ad, an administrative burden, but what we've seen in practice is that this actually expedites the process because once the people receive the, the, the documents, they would have already had an explanation um, and they would have met the individual. So uh, the, the two parts of the application process are the due diligence on the individuals involved and understanding the fund structure and approving it accordingly. With a face-to-face -face meeting, you've met the people and you've understood the structure, so you can expedite the process in that manner. Um, and as, as Alexander was, was rightly saying, this isn't something which is very common with European regulators, that you actually meet face-to-face. -face. I mean, uh, whether it's previously the FCA, CSSF, etc., it would be quite tough to actually um, contact them via, via telephone, let alone sort of in person. So that, that assists the process. Um, and... With respect to the regulator being, um, you know, approachable and, and, and pragmatic, I mean, obviously there are, and Alexander touched upon this when, when discussing the various jurisdictions and, and why one would choose one and not the other. Of course, when one is speaking about USITs or AIFs, um, 
the, reg the regulation allows you certain parameters, right? So the regulator has to stick within those parameters, whether this is in Luxembourg, in Ireland, or in Malta. When it comes to um, these vehicles, such as um, the PIF, such as the, the recognized incorporated cell company, to a certain extent, the Notify Dave, there the regulator can listen to the, the market participants, to the industry, understand the needs of the industry, and be um, quick to respond to, 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 to those demands of the industry. So this is where perhaps being a nimble regulator, the MFSA can assist the industry in, in certain manners with the more alternative asset class. So um, I think from my perspective, that is one of the main benefits um, that I have found of the jurisdiction. The, 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 the fact that you can actually reach out to the regulator um, explain the needs of the clients, the needs of the industry, and actually, in, in quite a quick turnaround fashion, uh, obtain, obtain results. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you both so very much for your participation. I'd also like to thank the attendees today for um, participating with their questions and for following this first part of the masterclass. I remind you that tomorrow at the same time, 10 o'clock um, uh, Central European time, there will be the second part of this masterclass, which will discuss actually the process of um, setting up a fund and asset management company in Malta. So today, particularly, um, we had Nick who mentioned the um, professional investor fund and the notified alternative investment fund. So we'll actually be looking at, together with the MFSA who are participating on the panel tomorrow, how to go about it, what the requirements are what the structures look like. Um, so again, thank you so very much for your time. Nick, Alexander, thanks again. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. So.